Hello, everyone, and, and good day. Uh, welcome. My name's Byron Cheatham, and um, I'm Vice President at Site of Viva. And today I'm going to be joined by uh, Dr. Jonathan Shanahan at Purdue University. Uh, and we're going to talk about Site of Viva's enhanced dark field microscopy and how it's used as an everyday tool in, in nano uh, research labs around the world. Sort of what was the inspiration for, for this discussion today was first of all, uh, Dr. Shanahan and, and some of the work that he was doing. Dr. Shanahan has been a longtime user of the Site of Viva technology, and I'll let him talk about that. But he was using technology, this technology at the University of Colorado School of Pharmacy and uh, moved over to Purdue University. And you know, funding's always a challenge when you first start out. And so he needed the Site of Viva technology at Purdue and was able to first acquire Site of Viva's enhanced dark field microscopy there. And then now later, he's adding the hyperspectral imaging capability. But Jonathan had talked about some of the, you know, the, the really positive benefits of having the, the Site of Viva optical microscopy capability, the ability on your desktop to observe nanoparticles and observe nanoparticles interacting with biological or material specimens uh, uh, at your convenience, right? It, it never fails to amaze us at Site of Eva, whether we're doing demonstrations or whether we're doing installations in new labs, uh, new nano labs, whether it's students, postdocs, the PI. The thing that really always amazes us is how they just want to look at their samples. Unlike traditional cell biology labs, which almost every one of them utilizes fluorescence in their work, and almost every one of them has a simple epifluorescent microscope sitting on their bench top. There is hardly a nanotechnology lab around the world that has that same capability. Site of Eva's enhanced dark field microscopy provides that capability, and that's what we're going to spend some time talking on today. Jonathan, if you want to add anything before we get started, uh, very quickly, I'll, I'll let you go ahead and do that, and then we'll move on into the presentation. Yeah, thanks, Byron. It's, uh, glad to see everyone here today. Um, you know, me and Byron are going to give a short presentation, and into that, you know, we're, we're more than available for questions uh, from the attendees. Uh, like Byron said, you know, I worked uh, a lot on this equipment, uh, with the hyperspectral capabilities at the University of Colorado as a postdoc. And then when I moved to Purdue, um, you know, I started doing my work here and something was kind of missing. Uh, you know, uh, we, we could not visualize uh, the nanoparticles and visualize them actually in cells. And then we started doing some TM here. And TM is great, but it was just taking so long to kind of get sample turnover um, that I got started to get a little frustrated. And I said, well, you know, there is an enhanced dark field microscope out here that will kind of meet a lot of my needs uh, currently. Uh, so we went after and got that. And then after getting that microscope and utilizing it and uh, manuscripts and publications and grant proposals, uh, we've then taken it and utilized it as a platform to build collaborations and also to seek internal funding to get the hyperspectral camera. Uh, so we utilized the microscope initially as a platform that we could build upon in the future. Um, so with that, I'll let Byron get started. Very good. Thanks. Thanks, Jonathan. I'm going to share my screen now with everyone. And what we're going to do first here is, is go over the agenda that we're going to follow today, as as uh, as Jonathan mentioned, we're going to try to keep this brief. But what we're going to do first is is, is outline some of the key benefits of enhanced dark field microscopy for those of you that aren't familiar with it. And I'm going to share a brief demonstration, uh, and it's going to be a demonstration of using the enhanced dark field microscope looking at live cells and nanoparticle interactions. And then uh, Dr. Shanahan is going to take over and is going to spend some time talking about how uh, enhanced dark field microscopy is used in his lab on an everyday basis. Then we'll revert back and, and talk some about the technology, uh, how with an optical microscope it is that you're able to observe uh, nanoparticles and nanoparticle cell tissue or other materials based uh, interactions. And then talk about how this is a platform technology. Cytoviva built its company around these patented enhanced dark field optics and has since integrated other technologies onto this platform to bring more utility to the ability to see and observe uh, nanoparticles and nanoparticles interacting with a wide range of, of matrices. 
So just a little brief note, I'm coming to you this morning uh, from the uh, imaging laboratory at Cytobiva. We're in the research park at Auburn University. Auburn is a state university in the southern U.S. And of course, Purdue University, where Jonathan is, is coming to us from, uh, is also a state university in the Midwest or the central part of the U.S. here in the United States. Just a little background, Cytobiva has uh, been providing this technology now for about 15 years. Uh, this technology has been deployed in between 350 to 400 research labs around the world. And the technology is now referenced in over 1,300 scientific uh, journals uh, that have been published uh, from these research groups around the world. So you can see that the technology is really starting to take off. And while that seems like a really big number uh, in terms of the number of, 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 uh, of systems that have been installed, when you stop and think about it, there are about 20,000 labs around the world that are engaged in nanotechnology-related research. There's a lot of runway still left, but that means there's a lot of nanotechnology uh, research laboratories that have no way on their bench top to regularly observe their work, and they're forced to go down to the TEM or find some other method to try to do that. And today we want to talk about how you might be able to, to take that action and, and, and use the system in your lab. Um, so let's talk about what this dark bill microscope capability enables in, in your lab. And the first thing we want to talk about is the ability to do optical imaging of nanoscale samples. And unlike that epifluorescent microscope that's sitting in the cell biologist lab where they have to prepare fluorescently labeled samples in order to observe their samples. With enhanced dark field microscopy and nanomaterials, there is no sample prep that's required. In fact, it's sort of discouraged, right? We want you to be able to observe your nanoparticles and observe them in the exact format that you're going to use them in. And so there is no special preparation that's required. You can take a microliter of nanoparticles, such as you see these 50 nanoparticle uh, uh, here in solution on a microscope slide, plate them on a slide, instantly observe them, okay, as we see here. But also, you're not just creating nanoparticles for the sake of creating nanoparticles, right? You're using those nanoparticles in some sort of uh, application, right? And, and so whether it's nanodrug delivery or whether you're creating them to enhance photovoltaics for, uh, for solar panel work or whatever it is that you're doing, you want to be able to observe how those nanoparticles are interacting with that biological or materials matrices, which is something else you can do with the system. And then finally, you can confirm the interaction of these nano uh, uh, samples with other matrices with other integrated tools that we're going to talk about, fluorescence, or in our case, we refer to it as dual mode fluorescence. And we'll tell you what that means here in, in a little bit. Hyperspectral imaging, Raman. We also have a 3D uh, in dark field nanoparticle capability that we'll talk about. So just to give you a sense of what this platform looks like for enhanced dark field microscopy that sits on your bench top, this is an image that's, that's representative of, of what a system would look like. And if we start at the top and work our way down, we're looking at an optical camera and there's different choices for optical cameras that you might need based on video or still and frame rates and color or black and white. Uh, but we can provide a, a turnkey system that would include an optical camera for optical image capture. Uh, a basic uh, research grade microscope frame with appropriate objectives that are optimized for dark field. Uh, Side of Eva's enhanced dark field illumination optics, which we're going to spend some time on. That's really where the action is with regard to this system and the ability to see these nanoscale materials uh, and a light source. And I'm not going to spend time on, on these except to say one thing. We know that also there are a number of you that might have a light or optical microscope in your lab. And there's a good chance that these optics can be upgraded on your existing light microscope that you have. Uh, and so if that's something that you might have an interest in pursuing, we can investigate that. Uh, it's, it's, it was designed to be compatible with a lot of different types of uh, microscope frames. So if you have a question about that later, we can talk offline and talk about that. This full system that we're looking at here 
this morning. We talked about it, uh, you know, being at a price point that's at or less than what you'd pay for that uh, epifluorescent microscope. We're talking about a price point below 40,000 US in depending on the components that you end up getting in the 36 to maybe $39,000 range would be a good estimate for what the cost of this might be. Uh, and now I'm going to uh, actually back out of this and I want to show you guys an example of how this is utilized. And I'm going to show this uh, by looking at an image or a video that was captured at Georgia Tech a number of years ago. And this was captured uh, working with uh, Dr. Mustafa El Saeed's lab at Georgia Tech. And, and Dr. El Saeed uh, is very prominent in the world of nanobio, looking at noble metal nanoparticles and biological interactions for a wide range of applications. And I want to stop the video right here. So this is a live uh, cancer cell. And it's a cancer cell where gold nanoparticles with a targeting protein uh, had been introduced into the uh, incubation of this uh, cancer cell. And so what the group at Georgia Tech was interested in looking at was how these nanoparticles were interacting with the cell, right? And so we were there, we had a live cell chamber that we were working with with this, and the group wanted to know, are nanoparticles interacting with the cell? And if they are, where are the nanoparticles being localized? And so at the demo that day, with our system and with the video capture in the uh, live cell uh, capability, we were able to easily help them understand that. And it was a pretty cool video and we thought we'd, we'd share it with you. So I'm gonna start and stop this video. And right now, so you know, we're, we're focused more down toward the bottom of the cell. And let's think about the, you know, this cell as, as a fried egg is the example I always give. It has lots of Z-axis profile, right? And so we're using a 100x objective, and a 100x objective has about a 200 nanometer focal plane, right? So we're able to section through in 200 nanometer segments at various uh, z-axis focal planes of the cell, which is what we're going to do here really quickly. And as we do this and stop, you can see nanoparticles that are, seem to be on the periphery of the cell. Maybe they're attached to the cell membrane. Maybe uh, there are some that are, are in maybe in vacuoles or different places inside the cell. But you see these bright objects here of different colors. Those are the plasmonic nanoparticles. And these plasmonic nanoparticles have different colors because as they agglomerate and as the biocorona uh, has an impact from the cell on the nanoparticles, that will change the way that these nanoparticles reflect light. So some may reflect light as green, some may reflect light as gold or orange and different colors. So now we're, we're moving up into the cell from the bottom, right? And what you can see here is you can see a clear nuclear membrane, right? That's around the nucleus, which is a very dark area. And so if, if you're not familiar with looking at cell structures in dark field, it's, it's a little different. And as Jonathan will talk about in a little while, you can also use a, nucle a blue DAPI nucleic acid label and, and, and see this nucleus may be a little bit clearer. But again, you see nanoparticles all in what I'm going to call the cytoplasmic area of the cell. Now, very interesting, if you'll look here and here, we watched all afternoon, so I, I know I have the benefit of it. Uh, these nanoparticles were moving in Brownian motion inside a vacuole or vacuoles of the actual cell that we're looking at here. And you can see that those guys moving there, uh, they were captured in these vacuoles and it was a, a pretty cool experience to look at that. Now, we're sectioning up the cell right now, coming to the top. And let's remember that the nucleus of a cell is going to have more Z-axis profile than I'll call the cytoplasmic area around the cell structure. And so if you'll notice earlier, we didn't see any nanoparticles when we were focused inside the nucleus of this cell. But as we come to the top, now nanoparticles are present and you can see in the cytoplasmic area, the nanoparticles are out of focus and almost disappearing. And that's as a result of us focusing this 200 nanometer focal depth up on top of the cell. Now, it's important to note that these nanoparticles are not in the nucleus because we're on the top of it. They're sitting on the nuclear membrane. But nonetheless, this gives you information about where these nanoparticles are in the cell again. And so you can see them very clearly on the top of the nuclear membrane. And now we're completely out of focus throughout the cell. And as we start to focus back down into the cell again, we see these nanoparticles on the membrane on top of the nucleus. 
And as we continue to section down, now you can see the nanoparticles have disappeared that were on top of the nucleus because we're now inside the nucleus. And as we go back to the cytoplasmic areas, you can see these guys that are still captured uh, in these uh, vacuoles in the cell are, are, are still moving around there. You can see the cell membrane again. So it's a, this is a, a really prototypical example of what enhanced dark field microscopy can allow a research lab to do on their bench top in minutes. It's really that simple. And I wanted to share this example because I just, for us, it's, it's just one of the, it's, it's a great example to illustrate. Jonathan, I'll let you opine if you have any, any comments on, on what we were showing there as it relates to your work, so. Yeah, Byron, I was just gonna add that, you know, for a lot of our work, you know, we get a question about, is the nanoparticle internalized by the cell or is that we're just looking at associated nanoparticles on the surface? And one trick that we've been utilizing in our lab is using, utilizing a DAPI stain to stain the nucleus. And so what we can identify is if we've got the nucleus in focus, any nanoparticle that's in focus is on the nuclear plane at the same time. And so that allows us to say, okay, the nanoparticles in the cell. Uh, the other key to the technology at this point is, is that you haven't had to modify your nanoparticle to visualize it within the cell. So you're not having to stain the nanoparticle or, um, or to do any kind of treatment to the nanoparticle, such as adolescent tag in order to actually visualize it in the cell, which is a strength because it opens up the ability to utilize fluorescent labeling of cellular structures. Uh, so you can begin to look at subcellular localization. Very good, thank you, Jonathan. And now I'm gonna ask you if you would share your screen and, and maybe go through a little bit of the work that you're using with this, so. All right, so Byron, is my screen available? It is, yes. All right, great. All right, so I'll get started. Uh, so today I just wanted to share with you some uh, representative images from my laboratory where we have utilized uh, the Cytoviva hyperspectral dark field microscope in our research. Uh, here at the bottom, I have two representative images uh, from when I was a, a postdoc at Colorado that were uh, one published and one unpublished. Uh, to the left, what we see here is uh, macrophages within a rat lung uh, following a silver nanoparticle exposure. And what we could see in this image was the nanoparticles had been internalized by the macrophages within the lung. And to the right, uh, you see individual single wall carbon nanotubes interacting with the alveolar wall within a mouse model. Uh, uh, so this was kind of an important image that we like to show in presentations uh, because a lot of times when you're lo looking at carbon nanotubes, what you observe is these big black bundles within the lung. Uh, but here what we could actually see is individual nanotubes interacting with the uh, airway surface. Uh, so just background on my laboratory is that we're a nanotoxicology lab. So we specifically investigate um, toxicity and mechanisms of toxicity following engineered nanomaterial exposures in susceptible disease models. Our research utilizes a variety of in vitro and in vivo models and techniques. Um, the ability to visualize nanomaterials within the biological samples for us is necessary to determine and understand differential toxicity responses upon exposures. And uh, the hyperspectral, uh, well, sorry, the side of even enhanced dark field microscope allows us to address these issues and to provide some kind of qualitative imaging uh, to our data. And so here to the right, I have a main, uh, image from a manuscript that was published that again shows nanoparticles within the macrophage of, um, from, that had been collected from a mouse lung. So in our lab, uh, one of the first things I like to do with students and utilizing the technique and also very early on in exposures is, is studies is to take the nanomaterials and put them on a slide by themselves and to allow the students to actually visualize the nanomaterials. And for most students, you know, at this point in their time, they've, they've run DLS and done sizing. Uh, they've utilized and, and measured zeta potential, but they've actually never seen the particle they're working with. Uh, so in the top left here, we have gold nanoparticles, um, to the right, we have graphene nanoplatelets. Uh, here at the bottom, we have lead oxide nanoparticles. Uh, so these lead oxide nanoparticles were actually produced in our laboratory by a graduate student, and we needed some way to confirm there was actually particles present within our sample. Uh, so we utilized the imaging capabilities of the, uh, of the uh, 
of the microscope in order to confirm to us that we had actually generated something in the uh, in our production or synthesis. And then to the right, we have, uh, bottom right, we have a picture of silver nanoparticles that we utilize. So importantly for us, this is the first time often students have actually seen the particles they're working with, and they do receive some kind of confirmation of, hey, you know, this clear sample I'm working with, there's actually particles present within it. Um, we utilize also, here shown on this slide, uh, nanoparticles, <clears throat> we, uh, for exposure experiments in cell culture. Uh, and one of the primary uh, endpoints we examine are internalization of the nanomaterials or uptake. Uh, so we often screen using flow cytometry, and that's the image to the left here. Uh, what we've done in this study was we coated silver nanoparticles uh, uh, with either human serum albumin or no human serum albumin to identify how this coating of proteins modifies interactions with the cell and uptake. Uh, there's a graphical um, demonstration here of the data here demonstrating that silver nanoparticles are internalized by the cells. And then when we add these biochronas, we get a reduction, shown in the reduction here in the blue bars. Um, and then when we give an inhibitor to inhibit a certain scavenger receptor on the surface of the nanomaterials, we get this reduction in uptake that's seen by the blue and the red bars here. Uh, this was confirmed by ICPMS, these results. Uh, but at this point, you know, we're just showing a lot of bar graphs. And uh, we found that, you know, a lot of times to really drive home the points within manuscripts and also in publications, it's nice to have qualitative imaging uh, that we can do. And so that's what's showing here at the bottom of the panel, uh, where we saw that nan silver nanoparticles were internalized by the rat aortic endothelial cells. This internalization was reduced when we add the biochrona to the samples, and we can visually confirm that here. And then when we treat the cells with the inhibitor of scavenger receptor, we can reduce the internalization of the nanoparticles. Uh, so this uh, figure here was, is very important for our manuscripts and also our pre uh, presentations to really kind of drive home this differential uh, cellular internalization. Uh, here's another study where we treated cells, uh, macrophages with either um, silver nanoparticles, silver nanoparticles with a complex corona or with a BSA specific corona. And we were able to determine that there were differences in uptake uh, that then we were then able to confirm again visually with, um, with the enhanced dark field microscope. And this is an example here of utilizing a DAPI stain and focusing on that DAPI to determine which nanoparticles are in focus. Uh, this is pilot study data from a collaboration we were doing. Uh, so we were concerned about graphene nanoplatelets. They had been proposed as an environmental remediation tool. And our thought was, well, if you're going to utilize it for environmental remediation and the graphene nanoplatelets go out there and they bind some kind of pesticide, that's great because possibly it could facilitate cleaning up. But the question is, have we, have we created something that's actually a unique entity that may have enhanced toxicity? So maybe the graphene nanoplatelets themselves are innocuous and the atrazine they're at levels that maybe are safe, but when we bind them together, we get an enhanced toxicity effect. And so what we determined here was, was that when graphene nanoplatelets associate atrazine on their surface, we saw enhanced internalization. And again, we were able to confirm this uh, utilizing enhanced dark field microscope. You can see the controls here where you have no uh, nanoparticles internalized. And then down here, you can see graphene nanoplatelet exposure and then the graphene nanoplatelet exposure with atrazine where you have this enhanced uptake that has occurred. Um, lastly, kind of an unintended benefit of the enhanced dark field microscope for our laboratory's purposes have been the ability to utilize it uh, to develop collaborations. Um, so not only can you utilize the enhanced dark field microscope to, you know, uh, visualize what we traditionally think of as engineered nanomaterials such as, uh, you know, silver, gold, carbon nanomaterials, uh, but we've also been utilizing with collaborators to visualize exosomes. Uh, we've also utilized it to um, visualize melanin. Uh, so here's an example of a recent publication from a collaborator who utilized it. Uh, they were producing melanin from a chemical pro process within their laboratory to utilize it to um, test toxicological pathways of neurotoxic, uh, neurotoxicant exposures. And they needed a way to actually confirm uh, that they were producing the melanin and the melanin was within a certain size range and, and things like that. Um, so this is an imaging that they included within their uh, our publication uh, that we were able to 
uh, to interact with them on. And then to the right here is another image of a cell from a, a animal that has been exposed to silver nanoparticles taken from our laboratory. Um, so in doing this and developing these internal collaborations at Purdue uh, with other researchers utilizing enhanced dark field to image anything from like Alzheimer's plaques in the brains, uh, melanin and exosomes, this allowed us to develop a core set of users that we were then able to leverage uh, for uh, competing for internal funds uh, for equipment. And this will allow us to then take our, our technology from the enhanced dark field platform to now include the hyperspectral imaging. Um, so by creating a core uh, group of users and collaborators through utilizing the microscope, we we're then able to be competitive to compete for additional funding to add to the platform. Uh, so that kind of ends my, uh, my talk, Byron. I'll let you take back over if you'd like. Awesome, very good. Thank you, Jonathan. We'll, uh, we'll go back now and look at the technology itself, right? And we'll talk about how it is with a light microscope or with an optical microscope that you're able to so easily see nanoparticles and observe at the nanoscale, as you've seen from the example video that, that I showed and, and, and all the work that, that Jonathan's been doing. And so what I want to do here is, is show you the enhanced dark field illumination system which replaces the standard condenser in a research grade optical microscope. And I've just shown you the light path and I wanna talk about the importance of this light path and then compare that light path uh, to a standard uh, research grade optical microscope with standard off the shelf dark field optics. Uh, first of all, we're coupling the source illumination directly to this dark field uh, illumination system. And by doing that, we're able to minimize light, so, uh, light loss as compared to the uh, standard uh, scenario that, that's set up. But also we're able to keep a more consistent refractive index with glass that we're going to use uh, further up the uh, optical chain. And then we're going to use columnating lenses and mirrors. And we're going to, to use those columnating lenses and mirrors to change the geometry of the source illumination to try to match the geometry as closely as possible of the dark field optics that are gonna create this oblique angle illumination that we're talking about. Because in effect, what we want to do is we wanna create at an oblique angle, an intense amount of photons in this focal plane. And we don't wanna have stray photons from the source illumination above and below this very narrow focal plane because we wanna focus this focal plane onto the, the nanoscale sample that we have on the slide, the nanoparticles or the nanoparticles and cells. And we wanna create the most signal to noise possible. And what we've come to learn is that in this process, we're able to increase signal to noise ratio about 10X over standard dark field optics that you might get from Olympus, Nikon, uh, Zeiss, et cetera. And so we wanna show an example now of how a standard dark field optical path works from the light source and why there are inherent inefficiencies in it that have been overcome with these patented enhanced dark field optics that were created at Auburn University a number of years ago. So in a standard scenario, the light's traveling from the light source through the base of the microscope. Typically, it's passing through plastic diffuser lenses, and that's bad principally because it's eating light, but also when it hits these plastic diffuser lenses, it's changing the refractive index, right? Again, of, of, of the light. And, and that's inconsistent with what we want. We wanna to try to keep the refractive index as close to glass as possible, which is 1.5. Then once it reaches the field diaphragm, the light passes through the air, okay? Again, there's a refractive index change, but also the air serving to eat light, right, in, in effect. So you have this light that's now about seven to nine centimeters away from the standard condenser being focused onto the condenser. And in order to be able to focus that light properly onto the condenser, which is the uh, traditional definition of Kohler illumination, you have to move the condenser up and down to focus on the light here, which is represented by this arrow. But then you have to be able to focus that light back onto the sample again. Remember, you have a very shallow focal plane where you have your nanoscale sample. So you have to focus that condenser up and down again to achieve what's called the main feature of critical illumination, which is focusing 
the condensed light, this oblique angle light onto the sample. So you have to disturb color when you do that. So the effect here is in, in incomplete color or incomplete critical, significant changes in refractive index properties of the light, uh, and, uh, and a poor image relative to what you're able to achieve when you overcome these issues. When we first commercialized this product back in 2005, uh, we went to Dow Chemical to one of their core imaging facilities, uh, electron microscopy facilities, where they also uh, had a light microscope with dark field that they were trying to use as a as a precursor for any work that went to the uh, to the electron microscope. And they wanted to do a side by side test with their highest end Zeiss dark field versus the Cytobiva dark field. And qualitatively, you can see these results here, uh, where you produce a significant amount of, of increased scatter from the polystyrene beads with the Cytobiva system versus the, uh, the, the Zeiss system. And uh, we knew they liked it because they, they bought a system on the spot, which is always the best indicator of, of uh, how someone liked the performance of, of the instrument. But then also we have a group in Korea that's been utilizing the Cytobiva enhanced dark field optics for a number of years to look at uh, microchip electrophoresis nanoparticle related work. And here they're looking at iron oxide uh, related, magnetic related nanoparticles. And they're chasing them around in this microchip electrophoresis environment. And they said, wow, we get really good results with the side of Eva enhanced dark field system. What happens if we just take the standard Olympus dark field optics and put it on our microscope and how would that change the scenario? And what they were able to do, and you can qualitatively just see not much signal from the nanoparticle and lots of noise outside of the uh, outside of the nanoparticle. And here in these images, you see lots of signal from the nanoparticle and hardly any noise. And in fact, uh, they measure quantitatively about uh, a 10x increase in signal to noise ratio with the side of EVA uh, enhanced dark field optics, which demonstrates better than I ever could by going through the, the light diagram, uh, the efficacy of this tool. And it's important to note as well it's really easy to use. We could train anybody in your lab how to get this image on the bottom in about 10 minutes, whether they've ever touched an optical microscope or not. It's, it's pretty simple to use. So with this capability, these are sort of what your expectations should be in terms of the ability to detect scatter. It's important to note here, we're not resolving right below 100 nanometers. We're detecting scatter. And you can detect scatter with noble metals and metal oxides down to about 10 to 15 nanometers. Polymeric particles where your scatter efficiency is not going to be quite as high, maybe 30 nanometers or a little bit higher. Uh, single wall carbon nanotubes or carbon, carbon nanotubes in general, typically you have a huge aspect ratio, right? You may have some that are 10, 12, 20 nanometers in diameter, but they may be many microns long. And so the ability, even at that small diameter with that aspect ratio to see these guys is, is, is really easy with this technique. And then finally, if we look at uh, exosomes or liposomes or extracellular vesicles, and Jonathan mentioned some of the work that he's doing there, we can detect the scatter from those guys down to about 50 to, to, to 75 nanometers. So um, with that, we want to transition real quick, and we want to talk about how this platform technology has been expanded on in a number of different ways to enhance uh, the, the application and the different things that you can do with it. Uh, and we want to talk about dual mode fluorescence first, which all of these added technologies came out of uh, users in research labs around the world that said, your enhanced dark field optics are great, but. And one of the first buts was, but I want to be able to simultaneously see non-fluorescent, i.e. nanoparticles, and fluorescent cell structure simultaneously so that I can observe how nanoparticles in this case are co-localized with, uh, with uh, different cell structures. And here you see just sort of what that setup would look like from a product perspective. And here we would use uh, a fluorescent uh, optimized light source. We would liquid light guide that to the dual mode fluorescent module that Cytobiva has developed. And, and this has uh, standard excitation filters, DAPI, FITSI, Texas Red, whatever combination that you would need uh, in a filter wheel set. And that liquid light guides back into these enhanced dark field um, optics. 
And then above the microscope objective, uh, either in the emission slot of a filter cube or even in the analyzer slot of the nose piece of the microscope, you would have an emission filter set. Typically, that's going to be a triple pass. Let's call it blue, green, red. Because if you want to be able to see non-fluorescent and fluorescent, let's say DAPI blue at the same time, you would go to the DAPI filter and you would modulate between the light path, the DAPI filter and the full spectrum light and you would see DAPI emission from the DAPI blue um, um, emission filter, but you would also, because it's a triple pass, you would see the, the combined white light. And this demonstrates sort of what this looks like. If, if we're in full uh, fluorescent mode with DAPI, you mostly only see DAPI. If we're in full dark field mode, you only see the scatter from, in this case, the C. elegant in dark field. But if we modulate uh, between fluorescence and dark field, now you're able to see what's fluorescent and what's not fluorescent simultaneously and in real time in the image. To demonstrate this uh, in, in, a, in another application that's really more traditional maybe for what a lot of you do, we're looking again at DAPI uh, and uh, nucleic acid uh, labels. And, and in, full dark, in full fluorescence, we can see the DAPI uh, uh, nucleus. If you're using an epifluorescent microscope, that's all you're ever going to get right? In full dark field mode, now we can see all of these confluent cell structures together, but we also can see nanoparticles that are in different areas of the cell structure. And again, when we go into the dual mode by modulating and mixing excitation DAPI with the full spectrum light and the triple pass emission filter, DAPI, FITZE, Texas Red, we're now able to see the nanoparticles, we're able to see the non-fluorescent cell structure, right, that's scattering light, and we're seeing the emission from the DAPI nucleus in this case. And then finally, it may be that your nanoparticles are fluorescent, right? We know that uh, with um, uh, liposomes or with exosomes in a lot of cases, there's a lot of work where, where these liposomes or exosomes, they may be fluorescently labeled and you wanna see them in a cell structure that may or may not have fluorescent labels on them. And this is an example of rhodamine labeled liposomes that are interacting with a live cell structure in this case. And Jonathan, I'll give you an opportunity uh, to uh, opine on, on any of this is if you have comments. Yeah, I was just going to say really quickly that we recently utilized a very similar technique here where we coated nanoparticles with fluorescently labeled albumin in order to examine uh, localization of the nanoparticle and the uh, fluorescent labeled protein within the cell. So the question was, was that is our, is our protein getting into the cell being carried by the nanoparticle or is it just free protein that's coming into the cell? And by utilizing the dual mode fluorescence, we were able to determine that the nanoparticle was in the same location as the protein, suggesting it had maintained binding. Um, I'd also reiterate there that when I first got to Purdue, we did have some labs that had uh, other dark field condensers. And, um, you know, I went in there and said, okay, maybe I can utilize this similar to my previous research with the site of Viva uh, to visualize nanomaterials. And I never was able to get an image that I was confident in stating that was a nanoparticle because it was very very difficult to differentiate the nanoparticle that I was evaluating from the background noise of the sample. So it was kind of, you know, leaving you guessing there. And then I would just reiterate in my lab, uh, you know, anybody that can train on the fluorescent microscope in 10 to 15 minutes, I can train how to utilize the dual mode fluorescence in the same amount of time. Uh, so it's not a very difficult technology for students to grasp, grasp quickly, and begin to generate data very quickly with once it's established within the lab. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so the, the next piece of feedback we kept getting from, from uh, research users around the world is your enhanced dark field is great but we want to have some type of quantitative spectral capability in this image if possible. And so there was actually a, another uh, gentleman that was a researcher at the time at Purdue University that was using hyperspectral imaging along with these enhanced dark field optics. And he had a home built hyperspectral system because he had nanorods with different aspect ratios that produced different uh, optical spectral twin peaks. Uh, and he would conjugate those to different breast cancer cell lines and was looking at different breast cancer cell lines and using the nanorods with different aspect ratios as the marker in this case. And so uh, I, when we, we developed hyperspectral imaging based off the feedback that, that we had seen from the group with the home build system. 
Uh, and as we were installing one of our first systems, the, the research group there said, wow, this is like having a spectrophotometer in every pixel or every nanoscale pixel of the image. And, and indeed, that's really a, a really good characterization of what we're looking at. This is what this platform looks like, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but you see here a dual port camera mount that we have. And this dual port camera mount can hold an optical camera, and it can hold the uh, diffraction grading spectrograph and CCD for the hyperspectral image. And now also we're adding a translational stage to the system so that we can do what's called line scan hyperspectral image build, where we build this image pixel row by pixel row. You can build a typical image in two to three, four minutes, depending on the exposure setting of the detector that you're using. And then also you have very powerful image capture and image analysis software so that you can analyze the spectral data, the optical spectral data in every pixel of the image that you build. And so you can build these hyperspectral images in the bisnear from 400 to 1,000 nanometers, in the shortwave infrared from 900 to 1,700 nanometers. In the bisnear, uh, pixels can be as small as 128 nanometers, very small in a, say, a 700 by 700 resolution image. Uh, spectral resolution can be very high. Spectral resolution can be at or below about two nanometers, meaning that if you had changes in the spectrum uh, from one pixel to the next, from between 550 and say 560, that's 10 nanometers of difference, right? So if you have two nanometers of spectral resolution, that change in that 10 nanometer space can be easily recorded. But the cool part is, is all this spectral data is in an RGB and a red, green, blue image. So what you see in the eyepiece is what the spectral data looks like. But you can query any pixel, get the optical spectral data, and do all sorts of analysis. Uh, and, I, and I'll show just, just an example of that. This is looking at a hyperspectral image of lung tissue where ex vivo lung tissue, unstained, where the mouse had been exposed to uh, amounts of, of silica nanoparticles in, in an inhalation uh, chamber in treatment. And so the research group wanted to be able to understand in the tissue, do I have nanoparticles? How much nanoparticle uh, matter do I have? And sort of where is it in this tissue that I'm looking at? And so here we have the image. And at the bottom, you see in red, the pixels where we're mapping the presence of the uh, silica nanoparticles. And because this tissue had very homogeneous spectrum from pixel to pixel, we were able to normalize this image by the background using a negative control tissue. And when we do that and we look at the tissue spectrum, it's flat, which you expect because it's been normalized against itself in effect. But then the nanoparticle itself has a very strong spect optical spectral response and it sticks out like a sore thumb spectrally, even if it's hard to see visually with your eyes in the microscope, et cetera. And quantitatively, we're able to map all the pixels with the spectrum for the silicon nanoparticles and get a class distribution output on this. And I know this is something that Jonathan used quite extensively uh, at uh, Colorado and also is, is going to be adding to uh, his capability here in the next few weeks uh, at, at Purdue as soon as uh, coronavirus will allow us to come up there and do the installation. So Jonathan, maybe talk about some of your experiences with hyperspectral imaging. Yeah, so we've used the hyperspectral quite a bit in vivo and in vitro. Um, the nice thing about it is it, it, you know, confirms for you each pixel within the sample. Is that our nanoparticle that we maybe did uh, the exposure with or is it not? Uh, we're looking forward to a NAR lab specifically because some of our nanoparticles exhibit uh, differential, you know, pretty significant differential changes in the spectral profile that will allow us to identify mixtures within samples to confirm like, okay, these are one type of nanoparticle and this is another type of nanoparticle in the same sample. Uh, furthermore, we've utilized it a lot to uh, as character, a characterization tool. Uh, so the spectral profile will be modified uh, based upon the size, the surface coating, and the type of nanoparticle. Um, and this allows us to uh, show another piece of data characterizing our material. And then also because we do a lot of corona work in our lab, uh, we utilize it to confirm formation of the biocorona on the surface of the nanoparticle. 
nanoparticle. So typically what happens is when the nanoparticle absorbs the proteins, uh, you have a shift in spectral profile that's quantifiable and you can visualize uh, within your spectral profile confirming that you've got coding of an addition of the biochrono on the surface of the particle. And furthermore, you can also utilize that same spectral profile to determine loss of that corona uh, within your sample uh, due to some kind of treatment or something like that. So those are just some examples of how we've kind of applied the spectral profile in our research uh, to the investigation of nanotoxicology and specifically the biocorona. Very good, very good. Thank you, Jonathan. So another piece of feedback that we, we constantly were getting uh, from re researchers using the tool is, is that, okay, we see our nanoparticles in the X and Y, and we can do the same video that you did, Byron, of looking at nanoparticles and moving through the cell and sectioning at, at, with a high uh, numerical aperture, high magnification objective. But we want to be able to show the reviewers in 3D, in the X, Y, and Z axis where our nanoparticles are. And so Cytoviva developed a 3D capability and has patented this capability that provides the ability to see where nanoparticles are in a complex matrix. Typically, we're looking at, at cells or tissue again to do that. And I, I want to show an example of this with uh, an actual sample again. And I'll go to close to full screen. And what we're seeing here is we're seeing a cell that's been exposed to gold nanoparticles. The gold nanoparticles are represented as the, as the red dots, okay? Uh, the non-stained cell structure is gray, and then we have a nucleic acid DAPI label for the nucleus, which you see is blue here. And the research group here was interested to know, are nanoparticles outside of the cell or nanoparticles in the cell? They didn't really expect to see nanoparticles in the nucleus, that wasn't the approach there. But clearly with the 3D imagery that we're able to create, you can see that nanoparticles, some are outside of the cell, some are maybe on the cell membrane and some are inside the cell structure. Clearly, you can observe that. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of the technical detail of how we create this image. Again, we have some patents on uh, the ability to do this analysis uh, after we capture the image. And we're using a uh, very standard piezo along with a specialized optical camera to capture the stacks that we then conduct a deconvolution point of brightest voxel algorithm and some other things to be able to create these, this image. So just wanted to be able to show you versus spend a lot of time talking about that technology in, term, in terms of how it works. And in this case, we would add the piezo, the piezo uh, controller, uh, the, the proper camera and software in order to be able to do the 3D imaging. And then finally, and, and Jonathan mentioned doing, looking at different nanoparticles, for example, uh, in cell structures and using hyperspectral imaging to differentiate those. It's optical spectroscopy. And while it can be really good at providing high spatial definition and, and spectral mapping of where these nanoparticles are, it's not molecular in nature. Raman is. And a lot of our users say we want a multimodal capability. We want to be able to do this high spatial imagery and hyperspectral uh, mapping, but we'd like to be able to run a Raman, Raman laser line across a nanoparticle area. And if we're looking for iron oxide nanoparticles, we want to be able to show the Raman signal for iron or iron oxide. And we want to be able to confirm to the reviewers the molecular fingerprint. Multimodal is a big term these days. If I can take a microscope platform and I can combine multiple different technologies onto that microscope platform, and then in the exact same field of view, I am able to capture data from multiple different sources of technologies to confirm it. That makes my case much stronger for the reviewers uh, and, and makes your job much easier. This is an example of what this platform looks like. And so here we're looking at the Hariba uh, uh, system. It's, it's the Explora Plus system uh, that that's typically uh, fits on. And you've got the lasers and the image capture for Raman here. You've also got the spectrograph and detector for Cytoviva with the illuminator on the bottom. And you're able to capture, in this case, we're showing a hyperspectral image of multi-wall carbon nanotube in stained tissue. It looks an awful lot like what you looked at when Jonathan was showing you some of that data a little bit earlier. And we're doing spectral mapping here like we showed you with the silicon nanoparticles. And here's the optical spectral signal. 
but here's the all important molecular fingerprint for the carbon nanotube, demonstrating that indeed what we're looking at is the carbon nanotube. And so this is the last enhancement that has been added uh, to the enhanced dark field microscopy optics to, uh, to help uh, be able to um, provide quantitative data with regard to nanoparticle and in this case nanoparticle and, and, and tissue interaction. So in closing, with dark field microscopy, enhanced dark field microscopy, any bench top can be looking at their nanoparticles in minutes. The technology enables rapid observation of the nanoparticles interacting with a wide range of matrices. And then finally, it can serve as a platform technology for any of the four additional capabilities that we showed here. And so I'll let Jonathan close maybe with uh, any final words that he has, and, uh, and then we'll uh, let you guys get on with your uh, rest of your Monday. So. Um, I was just going to really quickly say, Brian, uh, Brian Byron, that, you know, I've had good experiences with the scope. It's uh, really enhanced my ability to train students as well as to uh, send out quality grant applications and manuscripts. It's really helped with a lot of uh, presentations to actually be able to show students in the classroom. And then also when I travel places and give presentations, the actual nanoparticles and demonstrate that they're uh, inside the cell, uh, fluorescent label cells at the same time. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, I've had very good experiences with side of even the company uh, with preparing uh, for, um, you know, internal grant submissions uh, to, you know, maybe compete for equipment funding. Uh, they've assisted and proofread uh, documents and made sure that everything's stated clearly uh, in there and that I'm describing the instruments appropriately. Uh, in the past, when I've had instrument issues, like maybe didn't know how to do something, uh, I've always had very quick turnaround when reaching out to uh, individuals inside of Viva to get a, get assistance with that. Um, so I have nothing but really positive things to say about the, uh, the company and the individuals that work for Zyda Viva. Um, I think we do have a few questions, Byron. Absolutely, uh, yes. Uh, one question was about kind of the loading of nanoparticle, uh, drug loaded polymetric nanoparticles. I would say that, you know, in my experience and doing some of the uh, research, we did have some collaborations uh, where we were looking at different emulsions and they were liposomes uh, and they were, and we were able to utilize the side of Viva to determine if they were loaded with drug or not. Um, that, however, can be uh, kind of tricky uh, because it is dependent on the liposome formalization and also what you're loading into the material. Um, you know, you just have to make sure you have the appropriate uh, negative and positive controls there uh, to do that de determination. Um, the, la the other question that we had there was about specifically some of the spectral analysis I was talking about with the nanoparticle protein corona. Um, so in order to do all that analysis, uh, we were actually utilizing the software provided by uh, Cytoviva uh, for the hyperspectral camera. And I can't, what, what's the name of that software, Brian? I can't quite remember it. Um, say it again. The, the, uh, the, the, the Envy. 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 You're talking about the Envy, Envy. analysis? Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the analysis we did. And, um, and so we, you know, it generates all the data. Uh, you can get the spectral profile off of that. Uh, one thing we were able to do was uh, you can actually export the data files um, uh, as, uh, you know, kind of like at this wavelength, this is the, um, you know, the y-axis value for that. You can export specific data like that and then move it over to like PRISM or Excel or whatever in order to maybe produce figures off of it that if, you, if you needed to uh, for some reason. Absolutely. No. And, and, and we do also have, uh, Prakash, we have some experience uh, with looking at small molecule drugs and other types of drugs uh, in polymeric nanoparticles. And so maybe if after the, uh, after the uh, webinar, if you want some, some details on that, we can share some with you. So we, we do have some specific experience with that. And there are a number of uh, existing uh, peer review papers published by uh, current groups using the system with polymeric based uh, vectors and looking at, at, at drug loads that we can share with you as well. So there was, a, there was one last uh, question and, and said that, can you use the Cytobiba to observe the morphology of nanoparticles as well? I, I would say that that's really not possible in most cases. Now, if you look at something with 
a tremendous aspect ratio, right? So if we're looking at a carbon nanotube with a really high aspect ratio, you can get some information about something that's multiple microns long, even if it's nanometers thin in that case. But if you wanted to know, for example, if I had the right aspect ratio on, an, on a nano rod, you couldn't see the nano rod at 50 nanometers or, or whatever the aspect ratio was. You wouldn't be able to see anything but just scatter from the nanoparticle, okay? But if you had hyperspectral imaging, you could measure that scatter based on its optical spectroscopy and get some information on it by there. But I would say that this is an instrument that allows you to detect scatter it's not going to allow you to look at morphology of nanoparticles on a consistent basis. It, it has its limits there. I, I wish it could, but anyway, yeah. let's, yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I was going to say with our research, we get that question a lot about like, you know, well, this nanoparticle looks larger than this particle. But the thing is, is you're not really visualizing the nanoparticle as much as you're visualizing the scatter off the nanoparticle. So it's the equivalent of having like a shiny, like piece of silver compared to something that's dull. They can be the same size. However, the scatter off of them is different. And that's what the image being is being produced off of is the scatter. So it's it's inappropriate most of the time to look at to say that you're actually looking at morphological differences of the nanoparticle. However, as Byron said, those morphologies um, dictate a specific scatter profile and then spectrally examine. And those spectral examinations can tell you like, okay, this is the spectrum that goes with this particle at this composition at this size compared to another one that has a characteristic that's modified. And so Byron, then there was another question here. That it's about acquisition speed for image capture. And so for optical capture, we can have the optical camera fit whatever frame rate is necessary for your image capture for optical imaging. And for hyperspectral imaging, the image- Byron, um, yes. got cut off there, now you're back, right? Okay, yes. great. So Byron, we had some, a specific question here about the acquisition speed and the frames per second of the side of EVA system. So I was gonna let you answer that very specific question. Absolutely. So the acquisition uh, speed and in, 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 uh, is we can, we can, for the optical imaging, we can create a camera configuration that's going to match whatever uh, frame rate speed that you might need for the work that you're doing, right? So it can be very high frame rate. You're going to typically uh, have some loss of resolution for that, or you can have a very high resolution camera with a lower frame rate. So we can match the frame rate of the detector for optical imaging to match whatever experiment design that you've got. Now, as it relates to hyperspectral imaging, uh, acquisition is, is going to be slower uh, because we're building a spectral image uh, and the size of the image and the, uh, and the uh, speed of the camera that's needed from an exposure standpoint is going to determine that. But, but we can do real-time hyperspectral imaging on single nanoparticle areas and capture those single nanoparticle spectrum in milliseconds, in, in effect. And then finally, I think maybe there was one other question. Is that right? Uh, yeah, there's one last question about in the 3D images, you showed intracellular structures. Why is the plasma the membrane not visible? And I think that's just because uh, in that image you showed uh, you, they hadn't stained for it. That's right. Uh, yeah, because what they were pretty much showing in that image was you're know, using the dual mode fluorescence in conjunction with the 3D platform. And um, what you were getting was the image of whatever had been stained. Um, that's, that's right. And, and so with 3D, one, one of the things that we didn't mention, while you can do 3D image of non-fluorescent material, uh, if, if it's stained, then we understand the point spread function. So the specificity of the deconvolution and the ability to look at things like the plasma membrane enhances dramatically when we do that. So it, it, uh, 3D imaging is going to work best if you want to see a specific cell structure and you want to see that defined real well to have a fluorescent label on that. But again, you don't need to for the nanoparticles because we're going to use the point of brightest voxel or, or another technique to be able to identify the unstained nanoparticles. So this next question was kind of interesting. It said, is there any toxicity involved with spectral imaging as compared to phototoxicity? Um, so yeah, that is an interesting question. Um, I would say for our research purposes, you know, oftentimes the cells are fixed. Uh, they've then been, been stained, and then we're uh, examining the toxicity, I mean, examining the, uh, taking the image there. Um, you know, that, that likely is a, could be a nanoparticle specific of concern. Uh, we're not so concerned of it because we've actually fixed it already. And also the toxicity of our nanoparticles are, are kind of known and we can compare uh, to other 
uh, experiments we've done. So it's not really a concern that we, that, that we have for that. And that's not something that we've ever seen brought up uh, with with other researchers in in yeah, terms of, in terms of being an issue, right? So, uh, and there is the capability to do extended live cell imaging with this, with uh, different live uh, cell imaging uh, platforms that that we can provide in conjunction with the system if required. So, I think that seems to be all the questions that we have. Um, Again, we appreciate you attending uh, today. Uh, this session is recorded. We'll send it out to you guys so that if you want to share it with colleagues as well. And I would especially like to, to thank uh, uh, Jonathan for, for joining us this morning. It's always good to hear from uh, the end user and get it straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. And so, Jonathan, we appreciate very much you, you sharing this with us this morning. Oh, no problem. It was, it was fun. I appreciate everybody, uh, uh, everybody's questions and attention.